What up, YouTube? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Bizmatic, and I'm back with another one for y'all, right? This time around, this time around, it's rock stars who suffered the most tragic deaths. Now, we all know, you know what's crazy? Majority of the greatest artists that we get, they are troubled people, like trouble. Something about being troubled and being in a weird mental um, space, um, trauma, tragedy, all of that stuff, addiction just brings about great music. You know why? I feel like it's because everybody, some somewhere inside of them, inside of them, there's like this struggle that they have. And a lot of the times, the artists are just so open with their lives and just so open with, with what they're going through, they put it on display. And for us, we can relate because it's something that we're afraid to tell somebody else about. We're afraid to, you know, but then we can relate to it, you know? Because think about it. Everything you're going through, there's a song that you can listen to about it. Think about that. You, never, you ever thought about that? And that's the beauty of music. It, it could soothe you, but it could also get you trapped in the darkness also. Because think about it, if you're going through a heartbreak and all you keep listening to is heartbreak songs, now you just put yourself in a loop. But anyways, that's that's a whole, my mind just be going places, that's a whole other thing. Y'all let me know if y'all like this type of content where we take a break from listening to music to actually dive into the artist's lives. Since I didn't grow up listening to these people, to me, this is interesting. Um, but yeah, like, 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 like the video. That's gonna let me know y'all like this type of content. And y'all let me know what to do next. Send me links. I wanna do more documentary style videos and stuff like that. Of course, I will continue to keep the music coming. That's not gonna stop. But I feel like, it, you know, it makes sense to do this also, so y'all can see how I'm processing everything. Let's watch. <laughs> the phrase live fast, die young, and leave a good looking corpse became reality for many rock stars. From overdoses to suicide to horrible accidents, the following rock stars died Damn. tragic deaths. On the morning of February 3rd, 1959, early rock and roll icons Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and JP Richardson, known as the Big Bopper, died in a plane crash while touring together through the Midwest. Damn. The event became known as the Fucking Day the planes, Music Died man. and saw the first premature deaths of young and popular musicians in the early history of the genre. The crash also had a large impact on one of their contemporaries according to Magic. Eddie Cochran was a part of the first wave of rock and roll stars along with the three musicians who passed. His songs, Summertime Blues and 20 Flight Rock, became early classics in the genre and very popular among his teenage fan base. His appearance in films such as The Girl Can't Help It and Go Johnny Go helped his popularity grow. But according to John Collis's biography, Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, after the deaths of Holly, Valens, and Richardson, Cochran became obsessed with his own death, believing it was around the corner. While touring in the United Kingdom in 1960 with fellow musician Gene Vincent, Cochran's premonition came true. Following a performance on Saturday, April 16th, Vincent, Cochran, and others were involved in a single car accident. Cochran died the next day, Easter Sunday, at the age of 21. He was the only one killed in the crash. Third Time's The Charm, they say. Released in 1971, the Allman Brothers Band's third album at Fillmore East launched them to superstardom after their first two albums failed commercially. The live album is hailed as a masterpiece today. Rolling Stone ranked it number 49 on their 500 greatest albums of all time. The band's strength and leader was their guitarist, Dwayne Allman. Allman had spent the mid to late 1960s as a must-have studio guitarist, working with artists such as Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, and fellow guitar god Eric Clapton. Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top said this of Allman's guitar playing to Rolling Stone. Dwayne began doing things no one had ever done before. He was just a stunning and singular musician who was gone way too soon. On October 29, 1971, Allman was driving his motorcycle through Macon, Georgia when he hit a stopped truck. His bike jumped Damn, in the air and landed Georgia? on him, causing internal injuries. I Though still Georgia. conscious when he was taken to the hospital, the guitarist died hours later. The band continued without their leader, but tragedy struck again just a year later. On November 11, 1972, bassist Barry Oakley hit a bus while driving his own motorcycle and died from cerebral swelling. The accident took place a few blocks from Allman's fatal crash. 
Both men were 24 and are buried next to each other at Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon, WGXA reports. Mama Cass Elliott's weight has followed her throughout her life and death. As a part of the folk pop group The Mamas and the Papas, Elliott became a household name. However, John Phillips initially didn't want to put her in the band because of her weight, a wow. fact that came to light in Elliott's biography, Dream a Little Dream of Me. After the Mamas and the Papas ended, Elliott still maintained a steady career in music and television. On July 29, 1974, she passed away from a heart attack in London, England at 32 years old. Even in death, Elliott's weight was still the story. A vicious, completely fabricated rumor spread that she died choking on a ham sandwich. Many publications, such as Time, ran with the now-debunked ham sandwich story. According to The Guardian, yeah, Elliot's yeah, daughter, like Owen, that. who was seven at the time of her mother's death, angrily called the rumor, quote, one last slap at the fat lady. At the time of her death, Cass was staying in a flat owned by singer Harry Nilsson that he loaned to her for her shows in England. The flat would become infamous for another death four years later. No rock musician lived life to the fullest more so than Keith Moon. His chaotic drumming made him a legend, placing him second on Rolling Stone's list of the 100 greatest drummers, and was the driving force behind one of the greatest bands of the era, The Who. Bandmate Roger Daltrey told GQ that Moon, quote, lived his entire life as a fantasy. Moon helped create many of the stereotypes that still exist today in rock and roll, like smashing hotel rooms and his own instrument, outrageous spending, and frequent alcohol and drug use that usually landed him in trouble. So when people say, Keith, have you ever smashed up a hotel room? I said, yes, well, three in one fell swoop. On January 4th, 1970, Moon and his entourage left a pub mobbed with skinheads that were harassing him. While trying to escape, Moon took the wheel of the car and accidentally ran over his friend, killing him. The judge cleared Moon of the three charges he pled guilty to, drunk driving, driving without a license, and driving without insurance, because of the circumstances at the pub. However, his friend Larry Smith recounted to VH1's Behind the Music that the moment had an effect on the drummer that he never fully recovered from. Smith said that Moon was shell-shocked. Moon's demise came eight years later on September 7, 1978. He was pronounced dead at the age of 32 from an overdose of hemineverin. He died at the same age and in the same room where Mama Cass died four years prior. It is understandable to forget That's about a band's frontman when the lineup also features the likes of Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and Jimmy Page. That's what has happened to Keith Ralph of the Yardbirds. When American blues music hit England in the late 1950s and early 1960s, bands like the Rolling Stones, who were named after a popular Muddy Waters song according to biography, and the Yardbirds formed with the desire to put their own touch on the music they loved. For Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 100 greatest artists, frontman Steven Tyler of Aerosmith described the difference between Ralph and the more popular frontman for the Stones, Mick Jagger. He was a white boy who pushed it to the max, and he was a great harmonica player. You never heard Jagger hanging out on a single note the way Keith Ralph could. After the Yardbirds fell apart in 1968, Ralph continued his music career with various bands while his more well-known bandmates achieved greater commercial and critical success throughout the 1970s. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, on May 14, 1976, while playing an electric guitar in his basement, Ralph accidentally electrocuted himself, ending his life. He was 33 years old. How does that happen? When Paul Butterfield was only a teenager, he was already being tutored and performing with blues legend Muddy Waters in Chicago. The Paul Butterfield blues Should band helped Muddy popularize Waters? blues music, a predominantly African-American genre, to a white audience. Living in Chicago, Butterfield was at the epicenter for the blues, as artists such as Waters, Willie Dixon, and Little Walter lived and performed on Chicago's South Side. The rhythm section for his band, Sam Lay and Jerome Arnold, were hired from blues legend Howlin' Wolf. Butterfield's aggressive blues harmonica playing led his bandmate and friend Michael Bloomfield to call him, quote, the finest blues harmonica player in the world at the Newport Folk Festival. If he was green, it wouldn't make any difference. If he was a planaria, a tuna fish sandwich, Butterfield would be into the blues. Amid the backdrop of the early and mid-1960s, Butterfield would defend his racially integrated band and often get into confrontations with racist concertgoers, according to guitarist Paul Fiden in the Horn from the Heart documentary. Butterfield was a living legend during his time. 
Author and journalist Grail Marcus said that during Woodstock, he saw other musicians from the band and Blood, Sweat and Tears act, quote, deferential toward Butterfield. By the mid-1980s, Butterfield had reportedly developed a heroin addiction which had put a financial strain on him, and he'd been hurt by the recent loss of many of his close friends like Bloomfield, Waters, and his manager Albert Grossman. On May 4, 1987, Butterfield died of a drug overdose at the age of 44. From Oasis's Liam and Noel Gallagher, to the Kinks' Ray and Dave Davies, to the Jackson 5's Michael and Jermaine Jackson, sibling rivalries are not uncommon in music. Yes, there's always rivalry, tension between people who are related, but that, that sometimes helps music. However, few were as tumultuous and tragic as Creedence Clearwater Revival's feud between their two guitarists, John and Tom Fogarty. Despite being the younger sibling, John became the band's driving force, taking over all the singing and songwriting duties previously held by his brother. Tom did not enjoy losing control of his band to John, but John's control of the band drove it to superstardom in the late 1960s. After the 1970 album Pendulum, Tom left the band. Two years later, CCR dissolved from more internal conflict between John and the two remaining members. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, court documents show that John became entangled in a series of contemptuous legal fights with the head of Fantasy Records, Saul Zance. In these fights, Tom was firmly in Zance's camp. John described Tom as having, quote, some sort of weird Patty Hearst syndrome. During the 1980s, Tom was sadly infected with HIV from a blood transfusion. Even with death coming around, the brothers stayed at odds. Tom died of tuberculosis on September 6, 1990, at the age of 48. Most people first heard Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar on the hit David Bowie song, Let's Dance. Bowie yeah, described his reaction to first hearing Vaughan in an watch. interview with MTV in 1983. This little kid from Austin, Texas, came out and just played some of the most devastating city rhythm and blues I've, I've heard in years. B.B. King described Vaughn's guitar playing to the Media America radio network as fluent and said, he could get something going and it would go on and on and ideas continuously flowed. Vaughn was a music legend to other legends. Throughout the 1980s, he released four studio albums with his band Double Trouble. His guitar abilities placed him number 12 on Rolling Stone's list of the 100 greatest guitarists, and Vaughn is credited for helping to repopularize blues music during the decade. Unfortunately, during the early morning of August 27, 1990, his career came to an abrupt end. According to Guitar World, Double Trouble had played two shows with Eric Clapton, Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, and Stevie's older brother, Jimmy Vaughn, in East Troy, Wisconsin. Stevie Ray then boarded a helicopter to fly back to Chicago, but it crashed, killing all four passengers as well as the pilot. I did not know that's how he He was died. 35 years old. One month later, Vaughn's wow, last album young. of original material, Family Style, was released as a duet album with his brother. Though mostly known in the United States for a single song, Kirsty McCall was regarded as one of the finest artists of her generation in the United Kingdom. The BBC reported that U2 frontman Bono called McCall, quote, the Noel Coward of her generation. Johnny Marr of The Smiths said she had, quote, the wit of Ray Davies and the harmonic invention of the Beach Boys. Her duet with The Pogues' Fairy Tale of New York has become a modern-day holiday season classic. Jim Finer, songwriter and banjoist of The Pogues, told The Guardian that he questioned whether McCall could handle her side of the duet, but lead singer Shane McGowan had been a fan of her music and said she could make a song her own and she made Fairy Tale her own. On December 18, 2000, the 41-year-old singer and her two sons were swimming in Cozumel, Mexico, when a speedboat illegally entered the area they were in. She moved one of her sons out of the way of the boat, but was struck and killed instantly. Kirsty's mother, Jean McCall, launched a one-woman crusade for justice, believing that the Mexican government hadn't been forthcoming throughout the investigation. The boat was owned by businessman Carlos Gonzalez Nova, who was on the boat. Deckhand Jose Sinyam was found guilty of culpable homicide, although according to Kirsty's biography, written by her mother, Yam's wife and father-in-law both said he was not actually the driver. December 8th is a somber day in music history. The night of December 8th, 1980, former Beatles guitarist and songwriter John Lennon was shot in the back by a crazed former fan, Mark David Chapman, while walking into his New York City apartment building. I hate building. super fans. 24 years later, another legendary fans. guitar player would be murdered on the same ever. day. 
While performing with his new band, Damage Plan, Daryl Abbott, known as Dimebag Daryl, was shot during his band's set. He was 38. In 1981, Daryl helped form the heavy metal band Pantera, and his guitar riffs helped drive the band to success until they split in 2003. Pantera reshaped the metal genre over their two-decade run. Pantera's drummer, Daryl's older brother, Vinny Paul Abbott, said of the band in an interview with Rolling Stone in 1992, We pulled the very best out of each one of ourselves, and with each record that we made, that mountain got taller and taller to climb. The gunman, Nathan Gale, also took the lives of three other people, club employee Aaron A. Hulk, fan Nathan Bray, and Damage Plan crew member Jeff Mayhem Thompson. Gale was killed by Columbus police officers minutes after the shooting. Rolling Stone reports that another That's fan saw crazy. Gale waiting in the parking lot prior to the show and asked him if he wanted to come inside to stay warm. He responded that he was, quote, gonna wait for damage plan. In the documentary, Once Were Brothers, Robbie Robertson and the band, musician Taj Mahal said of the band, if there were any American musicians that were comparable to what the Beatles were, it would have been them. The band featured, among others, drummer Lee Von Helm, bassist Rick Danko, and de facto lead vocalist and multi-instrumentalist Richard Manuel, known for having a very soulful voice and the ability to sing in falsetto. Despite his immense talent, though, Manuel struggled throughout his life with alcohol and drug addiction. In 1977, the group split up but reformed six years later without guitarist and lead songwriter Robbie Robertson. On the early morning of March 4, 1986, following a show in Winter Park, Florida, Manuel took his own life. He was 42 years old. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Wow, that was interesting to watch, um, because <laughs> a, a, a lot of these deaths, man, which is which is which is weird, um, but the the whole suicide, a lot a lot of rich people, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists, a lot of people take their lives, man. We be thinking that oh, these people have it all. They're rich. They're man. There's a lot that goes into that, and there's a lot that that's on their shoulders, and. It's crazy. It's crazy. And the plane crashes, man. I don't know, man. I be scared of planes. Even though people say you most likely to die in a car accident than a plane, I still don't be trusting planes, man, because a lot of, we, we, not a lot, we had a, a, a few stars that died from plane crashes, like Aaliyah, um, who they say, they, I think they said Stevie Ray Vaughan, right? I think this has Stevie Ray Vaughan. We got Leah. We got Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, we got Kobe Bryant. Helicopter, but he's still something in the air. Um, we 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 got the the the, the dude from La Bamba. You remember that 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 movie? They died in a plane crash. Who else? I don't know. I just don't trust planes. But y'all, let me know how you feel about it in the comment section below. And it's crazy. There's a lot of these artists that I have not reviewed and like I'm like so curious and I want to review their music so y'all let me know man um and I'll see y'all in the next one guess what you better be there